and make sure that I have hit the recording button because I did not do that the first time and I'll try to be not quite as autistic and actually maybe glance at the camera every once in a while. Now, actually, I'm going to do it this way instead. Uh, we're going to go with something different here, but uh, for those who have been paying attention the past couple of days, I said that I was going to do a critical deconstruction of the lyrics of that new hit revolution anthem song thingy. Not quite sure what to call it at this point, uh, but the title is Richmond North of Richmond. And I'll tell you guys, so, all right, let's see, this is Thursday, one, two, three, four days ago on the WTF forum, uh, I said that I thought it was an incredibly well-crafted song, and I stand by that statement. I still think it is an incredibly well-crafted song. I've actually gotten to the point now where I think it is a little bit too well crafted, if you understand what I'm getting at. Um, it seems a bit more advanced than what somebody who just started writing music a couple of years ago might be capable of. Hey, you know, again, every, everything is a case by case basis. Everything should be taken individually. All right. But um, I don't know. I, I have my doubts uh, about elements of this phenomenon uh, that seems to have gripped this man, Oliver Anthony. Uh, and uh, we're going to explore some of those doubts here over the course of the next couple of minutes. So uh, grab your uh, favorite snack and a beverage because uh, we are about to dig in here. Uh, prepare yourselves mentally and physically as always, obviously. All right. So let's start with the first verse. Um, and I am going to do the boring thing of actually reading the verses in my uh, monotone uh, so that it kind of removes some of the emotional charge uh, that the words have been, uh, in my opinion, deliberately laced with. So the first verse, I've been selling my soul, working all day, overtime hours for bullshit pay, so I can sit out here and waste my life away, drag back home, and drown my troubles away. Uh, does that sound familiar to you? Does that sound like something that you may have experienced at some point in your life? Uh, some sort of feeling of something that you remember. Uh, if you identify with that verse, it's because it's supposed to be, uh, I call it like an everyman identifier. Like this is the archetype, right? This is who I am portraying to the world that I am. This is my life. This is the author of the lyrics grabbing you at the very beginning of the song and telling you, I'm just like you. Which, if you believe that the author is just like you, that is a phenomenon in psychology which is known as false consensus. And you should definitely spend a little bit of your time doing some research on exactly what that psychological complex is and how it flavors the way that you interact with other people. Again, uh, that is the false consensus complex. Uh, it's a very well-studied phenomenon, very easy to find. Uh, information on it. Matter of fact, I wrote about it. It's somewhere deep in the archives over on manufacturingreality.org. I believe it, it was in the essay, The Emperor's Secret War Chest. So if you head over there and type that in, it will probably come up for you. Just type in emperor and it should come right up. Uh, but yeah, so 
This is also what I believe is the programming portion of the song, or at least this is how the programming begins, right? Because what is being laid out in this first verse is the rule, or I'm sorry, the role, can't even read my own damn writing, the role that you, as the listener, will be expected to play once the programming has been internalized. As I said, this is the archetype contained right here uh, in the very first verse. Uh, and I know I'm backing off from the microphone a little bit. Don't worry, I'm recording it, so I get to uh, do post-production on this one later. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, move on to the pre-chorus uh, as Genius.com, which I have pulled up here, uh, refers to it as, I call it a refrain later on. You can call it whatever the hell you want to call it. It's the four lines that come before the chorus, okay? Call it whatever the fuck you want. doesn't matter. So the pre-chorus is, it's a damn shame what the world's gotten to for people like me and people like you. I wish I could just wake up and it not be true, but it is, oh, it is. Now, uh, again, just analyzing the words that have been strung together here in these four lines, this is obviously a lament. I wish I could just wake up and things would be different. I wish... Things would just change around me, right? Isn't that kind of what it's saying? You know, it's, it always strikes me whenever I hear people say, I wish. Because it, to me, it has the effect of removing the, the personal agency from whatever the object of that wish is, Right? I wish I could wake up and it not be true, but I'm not going to do anything about it because it is true. Oh, it is true. And I think the pre-chorus is meant to inspire that kind of defeatist attitude that, you know, if we lived in a better world, things would be different, but we don't. So we just have to accept things that the way that they are. And I guess just uh, continue being cogs in the machine? I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. But it, it kind of is starting to feel like the purpose of the entire song is to frame the world in such a way that causes you to feel insignificant and powerless. I don't know. Like I say, this is, this is just me breaking down the words and, and seeing what I can get from them. You might be scoring it differently along at home. If you are, uh, God bless you, record it just like I'm doing. Put it out on the social ghettos. Uh, we, can, we can have uh, media, uh, media battles. Be cool shit. All right, let's move on to the chorus. Living in the new world with an old soul. Nice juxtaposition there. New world, old soul. These rich men of Richmond... Lord knows they all just want to have total control. And I think that's probably a sentiment that, again, everybody can agree to, right? That seems to be the consensus these days, that the people that have the most capital are the ones running the show, and they want to, uh, well, it's the next two lines. They want to know what you think, and they want to know what you do. And they don't think you know that that's what they want to do. But I know that, that you know. It, it kind of sounds like, is anyone starting to get reminded of Alexander Solzhenitsyn? Uh, which is a difficult name to say, especially when you're high, because it makes you sound like you're drunk. 
But, uh, of course, uh, he has been making his way through the zeitgeist the last few years. And I don't know. To me, that just sounds like, you know, we know that they know that they're lying or whatever. How, however it is that that thing goes, I'm, I'm too high to remember right now. Uh, but it does. It, it reminds me of, uh, of that famous quote from that famous Russian author whose name I'm not going to repeat again right now. And of course, finishing out the chorus, because your dollar ain't shit, and it's taxed to no end because of rich men north of rich men. And I thought it was interesting that he acknowledged money again in the chorus because he already pointed out in the first verse that the pay is bullshit. Okay, so the money's bullshit. So w why bring it up again in the chorus and complain about it being taxed to no end unless, follow me on this one, folks, unless it's to make the connection for the source of these problems that have been laid out up to this point, that the source of these problems it's them reps and them senators that done this to us. We're just victims here. And thereby, of course, reinforcing the Stockholm Syndrome that we call democracy. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm completely off base here. Maybe I'm way off base here. I'm sure there are people who uh, would say that. I don't think I am. And I think if you hang with me through the end of this, um, you're going to see what I'm talking about. All right, so let's move on to verse 2. And I wasn't lying when I said I had notes. Got a lot of notes. So verse 2, the first two lines, I wish, oh, I'm sorry, I should have been moving this for you guys. Let's go down to verse 2 here. Uh, follow along at home. If, uh, if you can, if I allow you to. So the first two lines of verse two, I wish politicians would look out for minors, M-I-N-E-R-S, and not just minors, M-I-N-O-R-S, on an island somewhere. Which, of course, is supposed to be clever wordplay, right? He's, he's playing on the word uh, minors. Only, what it actually does is it downplays the severity of child trafficking by forcing a comparison to a completely unrelated subject. Right? We're, we're going to, in these two lines, we're going to compare child trafficking to the working conditions of people who dig shit out of the earth not saying that maybe there isn't an ultimate connection between those two industries, but again, the forcing of the comparison between the two is a false correlation, right? Two completely different subjects there, but we're going to go ahead and conflate them for the purposes of the programming here. And again, I'm not saying uh, that folks that work in mines haven't been exploited. I want to make that clear. These are just two completely different subjects. And again, uh, it's bordering on a removal of agency on the part of the author. You know, again, going back to, I wish somebody else would fix this problem. Because then we move on to the next line, which is, or the next two lines. I'll take a drink here. You never know that your mouth gets dry until you start talking a lot. All right. That actually even sounds better. Nice. All right. So the next two lines in verse two, Lord, we got folks in the street, ain't got nothing to eat. And the obese milk in welfare which is 
in my estimation, those two lines are a poorly worded statement exposing the inherent corruption in the system, which, you know, by itself, I think is all well and good. Again, something that we can all agree with, something that we can all share in, something that the populace can share amongst themselves. That's why it's called popular music, folks. But to me, these two lines do smack a little bit of revelation of the method, don't they? Because we all just agreed that there's inherent corruption in the system. We just agreed that, that this goes on, that this is part of the system, right? Hello, are you following along at home? Are, are you still with me on the trail as we're going? Because we're moving on to verse three. In the first two lines of verse three, well, God, if you're five foot three and you're 300 pounds, taxes ought not to pay for your bag of fudge rounds. And um, yeah, there's, I'm sorry, there's no other way to look at this, ladies and gentlemen. This is othering reinforcement. This is finding a target, any target, to focus your frustration on. Any target will do except the real problem. You know, tax money pays for a lot of things. Maybe it was just a case where this rhyme was easier and he couldn't think of anything to rhyme with blowing up children. I don't know. I'm not inside the mind of the author. I'm just trying to analyze what's in the words that he chose. Okay. next two lines of verse three young men are putting themselves six feet in the ground because all this damn country does is keep on kicking them down and uh, that right there the final two lines of verse three is the quiet part because remember uh, if you agree that that's what the country is doing your agreement equals consent. So I guess somebody else is going to come along and fix that problem because the person that wrote this song sure as hell ain't going to be doing it. And then we repeat the pre-chorus. We go back to the chorus and we repeat uh, the first half of the first verse to end the song. It is a very simple song structure. It's got three verses, a chorus, and a refrain, or a pre-chorus, or whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, you know, again, not, uh, the, the chorus is eight lines. Nothing else is more than four lines. It's very, very simple song structure. However, I did notice that there was no bridge. It's all verse and chorus. There, there's no change up anywhere in the song. And I found that odd. And the reason why, again, I don't know if, you know, this has, if this was like a stylistic choice, if this is because it was based off of the songwriting style of, uh, you know, somebody much uh, older, you know, thinking to, to like songwriters back in, at the turn of the, the 20th century in the late 1800s and early 1900s when uh, some people argue bluegrass was, you know, really in its heyday. Uh, again, it's uh, for discussion amongst yourselves. But I found it really, really odd that there was no bridge because... The bridge has been a staple of popular music regardless of the genre for almost a hundred years now. 
uh, you're going to have a hard time finding a popular song in the last hundred years that doesn't have a bridge in it. And, you know, again, like I said, I haven't listened to any of his other songs, so I don't know if this is something that's particular to his style or not, but that just kind of jumped out at me as being incredibly odd. It's almost like they didn't want to include anything that might potentially break the pattern that was being established. And I might be going out on a limb with that, and I'll accept that if that's the judgment that people want to put on it. But I think you kind of have to admit that it, it begs the question, why is there no bridge? All right. So uh, I did save, I think, the best part of the analysis for last because this is where the most important part of the programming actually lies. Again, uh, if you accept the supposition that uh, human brains function like computers and you know, essentially all you need to do is put in the right software and uh, you can get that computer to produce the output that you're looking for. Some people subscribe to that, some people don't. But if you happen to be one of those people, this is where you want to pay attention because the song ends by repeating the first two lines of the first verse, as I mentioned earlier which our subconscious has already heard. It's already heard those first two lines of that first verse, which is four lines long. So our subconscious is going to want to finish that first verse, which in turn directs us back to the beginning of the song to start the whole process over again, thereby creating an earworm, which happened to me, which is why I decided to do this whole deconstruction in the first place. That shit doesn't usually happen to me. And uh, of course, at that point, you're reinforcing the programming because just like Helter Skelter, when you get to the bottom of the slide, you go back to the top and you turn and you sit and you go on the right again. And then when you get to the bottom, I think you know where I'm going with that. So, um, yeah. You might get something completely different from, uh, from the lyrics of the song. And if you do, that's fine. Uh, I, I would actually like to hear what other people see in the lyrics uh, of this song. I think it would be an interesting social experiment. Uh, which is why, hopefully, I'm actually recording this. Let's check. Cool. I am actually recording this. So, uh, yeah, we'll do post-production on this, and we will, uh, we will get it out to the social ghettos to see what people think about that. I expect uh, that there are going to be some people that are none too happy with some of the things that I've had to say. Uh, I guess I'm just going to have to shoulder that uh, for what it is. I don't know. We'll see what comes of it. Let me know if you're listening to the replay. Let me know uh, what you think down in the comments. Not only about my deconstruction of the psychological leverage. Easy for me to say. Psychological leverage contained in the lyrics of Richmond, north of Richmond. Uh, let me know what you think as well, because I think it's about time that we all started looking at the media that we consume a lot more critically. Don't you?